little experiment with me. I would like you to imagine that I'm a tourist and you're the Grand Canyon. Okay? And as a tourist, I'm standing at the edge and looking at all the majesty and the beauty and I say good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That sounds like my grand canyon. It's Thanksgiving, and it's a day for us to allow our hearts, in fact, maybe even to tell our hearts, be happy, be glad, no matter what's going on. Just rejoice, because it's good medicine for you and for me. Welcome to worship. I see some guests here. Welcome guests. I hope that you'll enjoy your experience. It's the kind of thing that you learn by doing it again and again. Sometimes at first it's a little bit different. But it lovely autumn scarf on your shoulders there, guests. <laughs> I'm noticing all the pumpkin colors in the room today. Thanks to the ladies, who the fellowship team, who did such a nice job just giving us that sense of autumn and harvest and gratitude. I'm going to light these three candles. We usually have one candle here representing the presence of Christ. What might three candles represent? Yes, Tyler. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's a very good guess. And that's part of the reason there. How about... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's the old way of saying it, the way that our ancestors said it. Is there a newer way of saying the same thing? Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. The one who made us, the one who keeps us from the darkness, and the one who strengthens us along the way. So these are small symbols of great truth. And I trust that you will allow the love of God to touch you today in a special manner so that you come out of here feeling blessed. So we will sing joyfully. The first song is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. And this song always makes me think of Vi Inslee. She was a, re, a, a lady that was here, a single woman, but she was one of those people that would help with Sunday school. And she just had such joy. She loved the prairie sky and seeing the clouds. So as we sing this, let's think of all the things that we are joyful and thankful for. Please stand with us. April's thinking of it, right? Give me a tea. Tea. 
yelled, come on. He was just, there we go, Grand Canyon. Give me a T. T. Give me an H. scholarships and things like that. But think of something we heard in memory of by Andrew. What's something that you're grateful for? Any one of you. Shout it out. Health. Health. Who said that? Thank you, Martha. All agree? Yes. It's good to be healthy. Something else. Shout it out. Grandchildren. Something else over there? This weather, something else over there? Life. Is that what you said? Life. Oh, what's that word? Shebang. Thank you. It takes two or more hands to run a church. Other thing, maybe something a little bit personal, a time when God made a difference for you. A little bit like maybe a sacrifice or Anybody. Pardon? Doctors. Doctors? You're grateful for doctors. Yes, are You're grateful for people? Thank you. <coughs> Gratitude goes farther than wages when it comes to any kind of work in life. If you do work that is appreciated, that feels good. So thank you for that, Art. Any other kind of things? Any of you kids? Anything you're especially thankful for? Turkey. Turkey? <laughs> so, Mr. Gatton thinks I'm pretty special, but you think I'm a turkey. <laughs> Thank you for that setup, Titan. <laughs> Titan is someone that I'm grateful. I was with Gabby and Tyler and Jessman and all of the other kids. One of the things I like about Titan is the young man, we've had some conversations, and he's already writing stories, and he's already being a very creative person. And I really appreciate that in Titan, and he's very, very gentle and kind. A couple of more things, anything that you're grateful for? Your parents, the house where you live in. The Jewish people have a teaching called 100 Better Chet. Can you go Chet? Here, you can all be Jewish if you want to. Or Dutch. <laughs> or maybe something else. The 100 Better Chet was a teaching that said sometimes life is not very pleasant. Sometimes life can be hard. And you want to get discouraged. And then the rabbis would say, that's the time to practice 100 berachet. And what it is is simply taking your fingers and going, one good thing in my life, two good things in my life, three good things in my life. And the rabbi said, generally, before you even get to 10, you will already feel better about your life circumstances. So when we celebrate Thanksgiving today, as young people, as old people, as people in between, as people gone on and people yet to come, it's important to remember that gratitude is one of the things that makes us healthy people. It's really good for us to be grateful. And what's sort of the opposite of being grateful? Any of you children know? Yes, yes. Ma'am. Selfish or yes. Other things? Getting too focused on yourself. I think Jasmine's got a good way of putting it. Selfish. Is there something over there? Was there a hand or that just moving a bit more comfortable? Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, gratitude is a much better response to any situation in life than, say, complaining, grumbling, right? Those things do not create happiness. What creates happiness is gratitude. So when you walk into a situation and it's not a really comfortable situation for you or a situation that you really enjoy, try to think of one good thing about it. And maybe two good things about it. And who knows, pretty soon that life situation or that relationship will start to change. We're going to sing a little song. 
and the singers have <coughs> sung it with me a little bit to give us some confidence. And it's a song that we're going to learn. And that's some of you have heard the song before. It's called Thank You, Jesus. Okay? And then you heard it before? You have? You want to sing it with me? Yeah. You can sing it with all of us, right? Let's try it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Some of those are very, very conspicuous, and some of those are very, very inconspicuous. And we are glad to remember that the scripture teaches us that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And that doesn't mean that things are going to be made into one who counts and one that doesn't count. What it means is that there is no difference between those who give a little and those who give a lot. God doesn't measure how much you give. God looks only at your heart, which is ready to give. And all that is ever expected of you is to give what you are capable of giving. And the example of this is the story of the widow in the Gospels, who has two little pennies. I think you have two of those pennies in my wall. I have taken them out. Somebody gave them to me when they were in Israel. But the lady who gave the two little bits of money gave out of her need. Everything that she had was put at risk by giving a little bit away to others. And Jesus compared to this with those who had so much. And they, of course, gave more than her. But her gift, Jesus valued, simply because it cost her something. 
Now, thinking about each and every one of you, I began to focus on two persons in particular. And that's based on my conversations with Bev and Andrea and their work with our young people and how they have themes for the year and themes for the various weeks. And the theme that they're exploring with the children this time is faithfulness. And last week when we gathered in our home, a part of my home, with some of these children and some of our adults as well for our first confirmation session, one of the young ladies was there early, and we asked, so what did you learn in, in, in your learning time at church this Sunday? And this person, who was actually quite a very shy person, said, well, we learned about Daniel. And what did you learn about Daniel? Well, the Daniel was in this place in the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar had said that everybody in the royal household, the insiders, was to eat the very finest food and drink the very best wine. And Daniel, with his three companions, if you know their names, you can be pleased, they're difficult names, but Daniel and his companions decided to not eat the royal diet, but to choose instead a diet which we might call an agrarian diet, the diet that the poor people in the land ate. And what that was was a bowl of thing that was called in the King James Version, pulse. How appetizing would it be if mom brought something to the table and said, here's your daily pulse. <laughs> it doesn't sound attractive, but what it was was kind of a red stew made up in the main of vegetables. Daniel and his friends, and I'm not suggesting that we all become vegetarians, that's not what this is about. But Daniel and his friends chose, in the time of great wealth, where they were living in the royal household, they chose, by their diet, to identify not with the royalty, with the power, but with the common people. And they shared that diet with them. Now it was delightful, the young lady didn't go near it to the length that I was going to, but it was delightful to hear that this young person could already tell the story about Daniel and recognize that Daniel was being faithful to the way of God. And I want to make a connection with Daniel's faithfulness, Daniel's decision to eat a very simple diet that was basically the fruits of all creation, potatoes, carrots, turnips, and stuff, just a little side note here, I have a nephew, and my nephew bought a small piece of park, property by our back, and he lives in the back of the church hall there all by himself. And my sister, uh, my nephew's mom, told me that Vince has a pretty varied diet. On Mondays he eats turnips, carrots, and potatoes. On Tuesday he eats turnips, potatoes, and carrots. On Wednesday he eats carrots, potatoes, and turnips. <laughs> This young man, at a very early age, decided that he wanted not much to do with this great big world. You've all been to restaurants. When you go to a restaurant, and I'm finding this more and more difficult as I age, they give you so much food on your plate. And how much of that food ends up being scraped into the recycling? Why not just serve a little bit of food and then say, if you'd like more, there's more. Why do these commercial enterprises feel that we need to have our place filled with food? That's an important question. And it says something about our times. You see, our grandmas and our grandpas, when they came to this country, they lived, they worked, they enjoyed their lives, they enjoyed their communities, they enjoyed their church experiences. But they lived very simply. They had simple, basic diets. And you know something? These folks have lived in the 85, 90, 100. That simple diet, that regular exercise, that fresh air that that older generation experienced was good for them. And then we began to progress. We began to get better and better and better. So now we have millions of people eating junk food and sitting with their little machines. <laughs> you see? Is that better? And if it's not better, if that's your decision, can you do anything to sort of start turning the tide backwards a little bit? 
And I don't mean backwards, like, let's go back to having outhouses, let's go back to having kerosene lamps. But let's go back to being temperate. Let's go back to being moderate. Let's go back to saying it doesn't matter how much food you eat or how many things you have. What matters is the spirit that's in you. And that spirit of gratitude to the God who gives every good and perfect gift. That spirit and that attitude is the true treasure of life. And if you have that, and I grew up with that, at our dining room table, it was usually barley boiled in milk with a piece of bread on the side. That was a pretty common meal that we ate as kids. But mom just taught us how to be grateful for it. Mom used to say stuff like that, boy, are we lucky. And we'd look at her like, what, barley soup again, and we're lucky? She said, next door they're having a pork roast. Do you realize, when you have a pork roast on your plate, how hard it is to wash those dishes? <laughs> they're all greasy. You have to wash the pot. It's all greasy. She would explain that it was really not much fun having all this good stuff. What was good was having all this simple stuff. And as kids, we believed our mom. And she put it in me so deep that I'm 65 and I still believe it. A little bit with peace is better than much with conflict. So what I would like to suggest on this Thanksgiving Sunday is that what Jesus is pointing us to when he speaks about the lilies of the field and the sparrows and the kernel of mustard seed, Jesus is saying, for goodness folks, say folks, don't be all envious of the rich and powerful. Don't be all covetous, wanting what they have. Rather, celebrate the goodness of God who gives you your basic daily sustenance. What do you need to be alive as a human being? And it would be amazing if we as a race, as people on this planet, would decide that a little was better than a lot to recognize that there is more than enough food in the world to feed everybody, and this goes back to last week's lesson, feed everybody with leftovers. This is Thanksgiving Sunday. We've had a good year in the land. We've had a good harvest in most of Canada. We have had good memories. We have had good experiences. But let's not be content with where we are. Let's be motivated to spread the sense of gratitude. That is to say, if I, and I've done this so many times, walk down the streets of an inner city, and if I meet some young man or some young woman, and I spend a few moments in conversation, and I leave them a cookie, or if I leave them a piece of cake, or if I leave them enough for a coffee and a donut at the local restaurant, they have gratitude. And I have been God's agent. I've taken what was in my pocket or in my hands and moved it to their pocket and their hands out of my sense of, thank you, God, for being so good to me. Let me be good to these people. And then those people go away grateful. And I've learned in that experience that it's not just me being charitable, but it's me being one with them, being a companion to them. So every once in a while when I walk down the street, somebody would say, guess what, I got a little extra money today, and they open up this tin foil with maybe Chinese food in it or something, and they say, would you like some? And in that moment, as a person who follows the way of God, I recognize I was being invited to a neighbor's table, and the only appropriate response was, yes, I'd be delighted to share a bite to eat with you. Now I pray, dear God, keep me clean, keep me safe, keep me healthy. <laughs> but I pray that even when I'm meeting with my friends and neighbors. So folks, I encourage you to, as much as you can, be grateful for what you have and resist those who say, you can't be happy until you have this. You can be happy just as you are, just where you are, and with what you have. Happiness is a decision. Thank you, God, for our daily bread. Amen.
going into the world as nightingales, going into the world as sparrows, going into the world as chickadees, going into the world as creatures singing songs of joy. Let your light shine. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we encourage you to rejoice over some cookies and such. <laughs> My favorite part of church. <laughs>